All right, so it's a pleasure to be here at Wigner I Institute. I come once a year, essentially, maybe twice a year already. Uh, but it's my second GPU day. So the topic is uh, the calculation of dissipative phase space corrections. And uh, it's kind of like not your main problem. What I, so I heard from probably uh, Donnie yesterday that 70% of the problems are linear algebra, 30% of Monte Carlo. This is neither. So it's in the, in the noise in the remaining 1%, but it's interesting to me. So you will get exposed to it. OK, so I tell you what the physics of it, what mass it involves, and how we try to solve, how you normally solve it if you didn't have GPUs, just the CPU. Then I will discuss how I'm trying to solve this in GPUs and what I get. OK, so it's heavy ion physics. So we bang nuclei together to study something called the coagulant plasma. These are large nuclei at very high speeds. Uh, this is an accelerator at CERN, for example, the LHC, which does this. And I'm a theorist that tried to model this. You have nuclei colliding, and we believe that in a collision, there is something called a coagulant plasma that forms, so there are quarks and gluons which make up this system. It's a many body system, it lives for a short time. Some funny units, Fermi over C, and uh, Fermi are natural length scale and time scale in the problem. And then it breaks up, and in the end, uh, the particles fly to detectors. So how do you model this? It's a, a frequent model is to use hydrodynamics. It's nice because it's simple. You don't need particles, you need fields. So you save momentum space completely as position and time. And then you have some properties of the material which you can hope to extract by comparing simulations to data. And if you are more sophisticated, you have also viscosities, relaxation times, which characterize near equilibrium properties of this material. That's what we want to learn from data. But that's not what you see. What you see are the particles that fly through the detectors. So somehow, you have to make this conversion to a particle, which is somehow kinetic theory. And the problem is, it's ambiguous. So you have these fields, and you measure particles. If you assume that, and this is a strong approximation, but you kind of make this often because you want to make progress, is that when the breakup happens, your system is kind of a gas of barely interacting particles. Then all these hydrodynamic fields come as integrals in momentum space over particle distributions. These Fs are particle, single particle distributions. I is if you have different species in the problem. The problem is you know these in hydro, the right hand side. You have to guess these distributions. Uh, sorry, it's the left hand side. You have to guess the distributions on the right hand side so the integrals check out. If your system is locally thermal, then it's one to one mapping. But if it's locally thermal, you don't have any viscosity or anything possible. Your system is boring. All the hydro simulations that people compare to data have corrections to ideal hydrodynamic behavior. Pressure is anisotropic. There are additional currents also in, ch in charges like diffusion, if, you, if some more sophisticated calculations care about it. And these you don't ever get if you plug in a thermal distribution. You have to have distorted distributions. And this distortion is up for grabs because only these few integrals must check out. So you have infinitely many choices you could make. Literally infinite, you can write up classes, even if you have a single component system. So the question is, where do you get this from? And I will, but why does it matter? Because in the end, when a system collides and it's, it affects this collision, in momentum space, we see particles moving anisotropically. This is uh, the nuclei move in and out of the sheets. So you look transversely to the collision. There's more particle emission in one direction than the other. You characterize the eccentricity between x and y direction. And people plot this as a function of the transverse momentum. And these are data points. And these are simulations. And what they find in a calculation is that if you vary the viscosity, in this case, the shear viscosity, this curve changes. So I can do simulation, figure out which value works against data, and they could say, hey, I measured the shear viscosity of this plasma. The problem is that all these calculated curves are sensitive to how you convert it to particles. So then the question is, what should you do? The simple case is people cook up this simple, this is uh, the correction function, this is a non-thermal correction, you factor out the thermal distribution, and then people just put here a polynomial of order two, which is nice because you can match perfectly all the coefficients to the hydrodynamic variables, but it's not based on any dynamics. You don't know how to do this in a multi-component system. So it's kind of at the end. You can make it. You can make this work. It's ad hoc. What we advocate, and a bunch of other people as well, is to try to get these corrections from kinetic theory. So that is another strong assumption added on top that this system is kept near equilibrium through kinetic theory rates, Boltzmann equation. And then after a lot of hoops, you can derive uh, an integral equation for the corrections. So if I normalize the corrections relative to thermal distributions, 
turns out that there is only a scalar function that I have to find for each species, a scalar function. And these scalar functions solve an integral equation. I have a source term which is given by gradients, and I have some, a bunch of large momentum integrals where linearly these things sit in here if I solve linearized transports, if I assume the corrections are small. So that's the problem. That's the mass problem. Please solve this integral equation with known kernels. Well, it's kind of, which is, what, is, what is good about is the kernels know about all the scattering rates between particles. So it's nice. It knows about the dynamics of the system. Now, the way it's solved, it's actually a trick. You can make this a maximization problem for a functional. Now, the functional is quadratic in these functions. There is even more momentum integrals. But what you gain is a beautiful simplicity. It is an infinite dimensional problem. But you truncate. You take a finite basis in momentum space. These coefficients are the unknowns that parameterize the shape of your function. You choose some basis functions. And then, for this finite set of coefficients, this is just a quadratic uh, form which means your maximization is a trivial linear algebra problem. You take this matrix in the quadratic form, take its inverse, multiply with the source, and you're done. So once you have the maximal coefficients which maximize this functional, you have an approximation for these functions which we're hunting for. So now, most people, linear algebra, they think a very large system, and to do this inverse is hard. For us, the inverse is easy. We maybe have 10,000 by 10,000 at best. For, for us, what is hard is to compute this matrix element by element, because that involves, even in the best of all cases, four-dimensional integration, which has to be done numerically. So we, the, all the problem I'm going to discuss about is doing 4D integrals somehow. So one way is, is simple. You do nest one-dimensional routines. So you stripe the integral, say, let's call them x, y, t, and z. You keep doing one by one. OK, these are actual limits I have in the problem. And each one of them, you do some quadrature routine, standard thing. You sample your function with some weights. OK, you have to do some transformations. It's 0 to infinity, but it's standard stuff. And the, we use this 61-point gauss cron rod, which is nice because it uses 61 points to give you the integral. It uses half the points to give you an estimated value. The difference between them gives you an error which is nice, and then it's adaptive. It's in the GNU Scientific Library. If your error is not good enough, it bisects your interval and keeps bisecting it and bisecting it and always tries to refine the interval which has the highest estimated error. Eventually, you converge. The problem is, and you can do this on a, on a, on a CPU. It's maybe mini time scale to do one matrix element. I need thousands of matrix elements, and if I have multiple species, I need n squared in the species as well. So I need hundreds of thousands to millions of matrix elements. So you could do cluster computing. If you ever try, it's a pain in the butt, because 1% of the time, something breaks, and then you have to write extra code to deal with it. So anyway, you have GPUs. Let's try that. The problem is, in this kind of nested integral, I cannot do anything on this high level. So I, I do the innermost integral. I, I keep refining this to get each point correctly. Once I have this done, only then I can move to the next level and keep taking points. I cannot, cannot evaluate a lot of points together. In each step, I evaluate 61 more points. Or if I have two intervals, times two. So the question is, what can we do on a GPU? Last time, I was really totally new to GPUs. I thought this is like a complete difficult problem. I am being straight jacketed. Now I more think I have these little uh, nuggets, uh, these bodies. They are kind of limited in, in, in scope, but we can make it work. So this is what we tried. This is a set of ideas, 61 evaluations in each step. It's peanuts. It's not going to help much. So the next one was, let's put the innermost two loops on GPU. So it means that in each thread, I am going to do this 2D integral as I wrote, the nested 1D integrals. The code is kind of like this. I, I won't go through much. It basically takes, it integrates over the full interval. Then there is a loop here, which, 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 which runs until the error is small enough, or you run out of space because you have to store all these sections. You take a section, you have a list of sections. You find the worst, the largest error section. You half it, take its left half, right half, do integrals over those, update your sums and errors for the, the total integration. You, you store the extra section that you calculated, then you go back here, check again, is there good enough? It turns out that in the innermost integral, this is the number of sections I need. This is the distribution for the, for the z integral is like this, for the t integral is like this. So you barely go around 15 sections, so it's limited memory. They don't need so much. We did this. The problem is, 
that there is still the outer integral, which is not very parallel. Now I'm driving the outer integral still one by one because I can, have to, I can only do 61 shots. I send in 61 jobs to the GPU and ask them to please do it. So this was kind of a dead end until we realized that, until I realized that okay, this is not gonna work. We have to think in 2D. So instead of going stride by stripe and trying to refine stops, we are going to take 2D intervals this is 61 by 61 points. We send them all out. This is almost 4,000. This is great. Then we get, need to get some error estimate and figure out how to halve this 2D region. And we keep halving it, and that's another rectangle. We send another 61 squared points and keep halving, and eventually we convert. So we need a 2D generalization of this for the outermost integral, which was still on CPU. This way, we send 4,000 jobs to the GPU. So this is what it is, it's, it's basically a reduction problem. You do the 61 by 61 squared array, I can reduce them first in the x direction, and then I collect them last, and that is one estimator of the integral, or I can first reduce in the y direction, sorry, this is messed up the words anyway, and then you do the reduction in the other way, you get two different results, the difference of those you could use as an error estimate. So we did this, and then this is sitting on the CPU, and for each one of these points, we send it to the GPU, do the two-dimensional, one-by-one dimensional integral. We tried this. This is what we got in OpenCL, 10 minutes for a certain kind of job, which involves about 300 matrix element calculations with a basis, uh, which somehow powers of square root. The single square root was two hours, so great, it's about factor 10. Uh, I actually thought I was running on GPU at the time, but this was actually OpenCL running on CPU. And then we discussed with the, with, the, with, the, with the gurus here and we realized, oh no, my kernel is large for a GPU, probably will register too many registers I'm using, so it's kind of a dead end to move. So I said, fine, so what can I do? And the suggestion was that forget about the, all the logic of iterative integration on the GPU, just use it to evaluate your integrand. So this is what I did. I put all the adaptive two-dimensional integrator on CPU. There is an outer loop XY, an inner loop TZ. These are all 2D iterative uh, integrators. And then in the inner loop, I send my little TZ rectangle to the GPU to compute. Each thread computes one kernel, uh, one uh, integral evaluations. Since I have two halves, I basically have about uh, 7,000 evaluations, which is great. All the logic is written on CPU. I did this, a little bit better you can do is, you have to send a lot of data back to CPU because all the reductions would happen on CPU. I have the reductions, the first one of the uh, 61 weighted sum of numbers, I can actually afford to do on GPU, it's fairly easy to code. So in the end, what I bring back is 61 extra numbers for each little rectangle which I reduce on CPU. And, and that was my algorithm idea three. And you will see some benchmarks for this. And this actually is good, it works, but if you think a little bit more, there is one more thing you can do. And that is that, because the GPU still doesn't have much work, I have 7,000 numbers that I want to get uh, in each uh, step, essentially, on the GPU, so I have 7,000 threads. But I have n squared matrix elements I want to compute. Each one of them, somewhere in the guts, has this evaluate, please, the integrand for a rectangle. So, if I could somehow pull the GPU part together and do it in one, I get an extra factor n squared. So that means that I need about 10 numbers roughly to parameterize my range that I want to integrate over. That's about 100 bytes. I had to send n squared of that to the GPU. The GPU then does 7,000 times n squared evaluations, each in, in a one thread. It, it basically uses about six, 600 or 0.6 megabytes for this to, to internally and times n squared, but still okay, and it's not super large to run out everything. Then it does reductions. All these 7,000 numbers gets reduced, reduced with 100, 100 some reductions times n squared, so the memory now is smaller. The remaining about 20, 120 bytes times n squared has to come back, 120 doubles, so it's about uh, a few kilobytes. So, but I had to rewrite essentially all the code because before that it was loop over all matrix elements and evaluate them. Now it's like you have an evaluator, essentially some, some structure that, some, 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 some logic which is all incorporated into some, some entity which does integration. And there is a, a whole list of them, 
and you, have, you can check whether they are converged. If they are not converged, you have to build up a list in each step. Where do they want to know more about the integrand? You, you loop through all the, all the little integrators in this pool of integrators. You find which regions they want next. You build up a list of those. Once you have all that list, you send this in one step to the GPU. Now you're doing hundreds of thousands or millions of calculations on the GPU. Once the result comes back, which is like 120 doubles each for each result, you have to update all, with, with all this data, all the evaluators, and then keep going back and checking whether you converge. So it's possible to do, and it's beneficial. Here is wall clock in minutes for a bulk viscous calculation with the same type of thing. There's basically n by n problem. How many matrix elements I have? 6 by 6, 11 by 11, it goes up to 26 by 26. These were the numbers for single threaded evaluation. These were my two hours that I quoted before, which on OpenCL, still on CPU, on the Opteron, was about 20, 12 minutes. Now I instead have GPU result, which without the pooling is just literally the GPU just evaluates function evaluation 7,000 times in each loop, and then I have an outer loop for all matrix elements. The numbers come down. These are all minutes. So I'm faster than uh, single-threaded, barely. But then if I pool everything together, then I have an order of magnitude uh, to almost factor 30 speed up. So in the end, my best calculations are these. I essentially didn't want to study all the, all, the, uh, all the speeds because it's probably pointless. But in 11 minutes compared to I don't know how many hours uh, or even maybe day scale, I can solve some problem. So I sped it up by at least factor 25. And that's where I am right now. So let's see what it means. So suppose you compute this. So how does this function look like? This is a typical calculation. Here is the correction function due to bulk viscous effects in the, plus, uh, in the, in the, in the gas. And uh, this is momentum. This is this correction function. This is it for protons, which have a small mass. So mass over temperature is the relevant scale. It's about 1. If you study kaons, which is about 3, it's a different function. If you look at protons, it's a different function. And then all these things go into calculation of particle distributions, calculation of anisotropies, and it's a lot of, lot of folding together. But the main point, it's not a simple function. It's hard to parameterize it easily. It's not monotonic. In this matter, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, so there will be cancellations, and so on. If you put it in the calculation, this is this anisotropy parameter as a function of momentum you get this kind of typical rising shape. If you ignore all these effects, you just say, I don't care about you have non-thermal corrections. I'm just going to cheat. You don't conserve energy momentum that way, fine, but I don't care. Then you get this kind of plot. This is proton. Now, all the other curves have some corrections, shear viscosity, bulk viscosity. There are dashed lines where people use these ad hoc quadratic forms. So for example, if there is only bulk viscous correction, protons would have a higher anisotropy. If you have shear viscous corrections, they would have a smaller anisotropy. If you add both of them, you would get this green curve. Whereas if you do it my way, then every single curve is within 10, 20 percent different. Both the bulk correction, different, especially at high momentum, the pure shear correction is different. All these are the solid. This is the real dynamical calculated from kinetic theory. And if you add them together, this is my best result. And you would have to compare this to the dashed green, dashed green and you see it's about at least 10, 20 percent effect. Uh, that is in there because it matters how you convert it to the particles. Now, why does it matter? Because again, if you get data points through this curve, you will need different viscosity. So this is the summary. Self-consistent phase space corrections are important. You cannot avoid them ever if you compare hydrodynamics to heavy uh, to particles, heavy ion physics data. If you want to do this right, you can use kinetic theory. You have to do some for the integrals, quite some millions of them. We have a, a, a routine which can do this in multi-threaded way on GPU. It uses this 2D generalization of the gauss cronut quadrature. It's adaptive. And it also pulls the evaluations of the, the key piece in the integrand over multiple uh, matrix elements, all of them that I need to do it in one go. This gives me uh, maybe about a one, one and a half order of magnitude speed up. What is missing is I have to, of course, I want to put extra factors 3,000 inside this loop because I want to see how fast I get that way. This probably requires actually some games with how much you evaluate and how much you want to do the reduction of the kernels because I might run out of the data 
uh, the, the RAM on, on the GPU if I don't do this the right way. And of course, I can attack harder problems because now I'm faster than, than on, a, on a cluster. I can compute shear viscous data. So it's a slow kernel, but it's easy to do. Or the, the nice thing is I could do 5D integrals now, potentially, and then I could do angle-dependent cross-sections. So thank you very much. And thanks to all the two gurus, especially here, who I almost owe all my GPU knowledge to. So thank you very much. <coughs> Dana? Just a naive question. In, in multidimensional spaces where you do integrals, usually Monte Carlo integrals are superior to Gauss and other methods. Have you tried this or, or is this a, a method here? To use? I am actually below the threshold. So, so it's only four dimensions. And depending on how smooth you think the function is, uh, it may just be the edge or it's still on the side of doing smooth techniques compared to stochastic. But I would be really, really crying if my convergence were one of a square of n for these matrix elements. Because I eventually would do an inverse matrix. So, and, and this matrix is already ill-conditioned. So, so if, if, if I have errors which are like, like, ten, uh, like 1 per mil, like, like 0.1%, I probably will never solve this problem correctly. So I, right now, my accuracy is 10 to the minus 10 for the matrix. At least the estimated one. Of course, you never know what there is. <clears throat> We need to move on because of lack of yes. time. Thanks, Danish, again.